All right, happy Friday, everyone. So topic four today. Before we get into topic four, I just want to talk a little bit about uh, the lab. So hopefully everyone had a chance to look at lab two yesterday. So just a reminder what you need to do for uh, your assignment is uh, basically you need to answer these questions, okay? Uh, for this report is worth 3% of your final grade. This is not a formal report. I'm calling it a short report. Uh, for that reason, so you don't need to write out a full introduction, methods, and all those kind of things. Uh, what you need to do is answer these questions, okay? Um, you will get a chance to do a formal report, and that's going to be for Lab 3, and that's why we have a Lab 3 pre-lab uh, to kind of get us ready for Lab 3, because that's kind of a big event for the lab for the semester, is uh, doing this pre-lab formal report. So over the next few lectures, uh, over the next couple of weeks, uh, once we start with Lab 3, I'm going to, at the beginning of every lecture, probably spend two to three minutes kind of talking about lab reports. And, uh, for, you know, for example, one day I might talk about introduction, another day I'll talk about uh, results or graphing, another day I'll talk about how to reference and things like that. So, if you have any questions, like I said, do come and see me. Uh, and this is due, um, the lab, uh, this particular exercise here is due next Thursday. So you can hand it in on Moodle, and uh, if you have any uh, questions or problems with that, please let me know. Uh, other than that, I'm expecting they're going to be in there, and everyone's going to do a wonderful job. Do make sure you take a good look at the videos. I do drop a lot of hints on how to answer the questions, and uh, so I'm expecting everyone will follow those instructions and do really well on, uh, on the lab report. So I, uh, just a little bit of a warning. Um, you know, I, I am a bit of a picky marker. so. Uh, do make sure you follow the instructions. If you're not following the instructions uh, carefully, uh, there's a good chance you're going to lose marks for, for those kind of things. For example, uh, you can see I'm looking at questions eight to nine. It's talking about referencing and citing, right? Um, every comma and, and period and bold and italics needs to be in the right place. And if it's not, uh, you're going to lose marks for those kind of things. So do take a look at the videos. I have some examples in the videos. Uh, do take a look at the other material I sent you, like Appendix A, and uh, hopefully um, all the information is there. And uh, last resort, do, uh, do reach out to me. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to help you uh, during any of my office hours. So one last note. Um, so try to hand in your, your things one document if you can. If you can't, I think it allows you to submit up to 10 documents so I can probably combine them together, um, but it's not a bad idea to familiarize yourself with how Word works in terms of inserting images and things like that. And, and that's something I can help you with too as well if you're having any questions about how to uh, do certain functions in Microsoft Word. And um, it would be really helpful if you do put your name in the document that you submit. Some people just like to call it Lab 1 and things like that. Uh, but your name in the document, that helps me with the grading process, and that's really important. Um, even better, you could put labs one, two, and that would help as well. Okay, so let us get into topic four. So topic four, we're going to talk about membranes, we're going to talk about membrane transport, and we're going to talk about cell walls. So this will be uh, probably, um, I'm hoping it's a lecture and a half, up to two lectures of material. And uh, hopefully there's a lot of stuff here you've seen before, uh, maybe a few more details. And uh, topic five, we're going to talk about bacteria and archaea. And topic six, we're going to talk about uh, eukaryotic cells. And then after that, we're going to have our midterm, which is sometime early February. I can't remember the date off my head. We have a little bit of time to think about it. But you can take a look. I did put the sample midterm on Moodle. Uh, it's found just after the lecture notes on topic four here. So if you want to take a look and scroll down, you can take a look at that sample midterm. Um, somebody's telling me that it's the 12th of February, so that gives us uh, at least a couple of weeks anyway to think about it. Um, it doesn't hurt always to, to start thinking about it now. Like I said, you can download that sample midterm and take a look at it. Uh, that's a midterm from a few years ago, but it gives you kind of a good, decent idea of what my exams look like. Uh, obviously, the online experience is going to be a little bit different, and, uh, but you got an idea of what the questions look like and maybe some of the difficulty of the questions, hopefully, as well. I'll see what I can do about finding some other materials to uh, give everyone for practice uh, for the online experience. Maybe I'll, I'll see if I can put together like a sample uh, online one, um, if I can uh, find some time to, uh, to work on that and uh, help people out in that regard. 
So topic four is on membranes. And so uh, first question is, what is a membrane, right? So a membrane, you can see there's a definition. It's talking about it being a, a lipid bilayer and it's separating a cell or an organelle from its surroundings. So you probably know a little bit about that, about membranes, and you probably know that they're made out of things like phospholipids, but of course there's also proteins. That's about 50% of the mass of a, of a membrane is proteins, and sometimes they have carbohydrates as well, although those carbohydrate labels aren't doing very good, are they? They've sort of shifted over a little bit. Uh, but we'll talk about carbohydrates. Uh, this diagram here also shows a, uh, an extracellular matrix and the cytoskeleton. And uh, so we're gonna talk a little bit about those things as well, but just a little bit, so don't worry about those for now. And those, uh, actually the cytoskeleton is topic seven, which is after the midterm, so you don't have to worry about it at all right now. So let's talk about these parts of a membrane and what is in there. So uh, uh, I guess I've numbered them wrong. I meant to go one for lipids, two for proteins, and three for carbohydrates, but uh, let's talk about these things. So we've already talked about phospholipids, as being these um, interesting molecules. And if you remember, I used a term, uh, we use this term here, so amphipathic, amphipathic. So maybe you remember what that term means, maybe you don't. Um, this is a term that means the molecule has polar and nonpolar components to it. So if you take a look, I have, uh, oh, I've got the structure here, and there's the word. So uh, you can see, if you take a look at this, we've got down here, we've got these uh, fatty acid um, uh, tails here. These are all carbons and hydrogens. And so that's very hydrophobic or nonpolar. And then up over here, we've got these charge groups, one of them being a phosphate. So that's why it's called a phospholipid. And so you've got this sort of dual natured molecule that can interact with uh, both hydrophobic things and also interact with water. So when you put these things into a, um, solution, you get this, uh, this bilayer thing, which is uh, actually what a big component of these biological membranes that are separating the cell from the surroundings. I want to show you something kind of interesting. Uh, we are going to talk about archaea. Uh, that will be next unit in more detail. But here is something that is kind of interesting about archaea. So if you take a look, this is showing uh, a phospholipid bilayer that you would find in bacteria and eukaryotes. Archaea, they do things just a little differently. Um, some archaea have monolayers. So uh, it's uh, kind of a different type of lipid where uh, rather than having a bilayer, it's actually uh, kind of a monolayer. Uh, if you look at the chemistry of these things too, the, uh, the uh, fatty acids are branched and they have uh, uh, ether linkages instead of ester linkages, which uh, a little bit of chemistry for you there. Uh, and these ones are found, um, these monolayer ones, by the way, are found in, in some of the organisms that live in these really hot environments. But uh, just showing you that uh, archaea are different, and that's why they have their own domain. So more on them in the next unit. We're going to talk about the archaea, and uh, a lot of it comes down to these kind of things, a little bit to do with the chemistry and, uh, and, the, and their physiology. So because, uh, you know, they're very small, we can't, how else are you going to classify them, right? So number two are the membrane proteins. And uh, so these membrane proteins, um, some of them are completely embedded uh, within the membrane and some of them are kind of loosely associated. Uh, so notice uh, one thing I want to point out here is that um, you can see right here, it's talking about these proteins, right? And so this whole zone here, this whole zone is hydrophobic, right? This is where we have our fatty acids. So no surprise that that's where you're gonna find hydrophobic amino acids. This region here, you can see facing the water, this is uh, of course hydrophilic or polar. It's interacting with water. So you're gonna have hydrophilic amino acids. So make sure you know what those terms mean. If you don't know what hydrophobic and hydrophilic are, that's kind of something important to understand uh, when we're discussing membranes. So, we may talk about these proteins in different ways. There's different words to use for them. Uh, one word we use for proteins that are embedded is integral. So there's that word integral. Um, it, it's kind of like, it's the same as the word integrated, right? These things are totally embedded in there. And so most of the amino acids in these particular proteins 
are going to be uh, hydrophobic because they're found in that hydrophobic zone of the, uh, of the phospholipid bilayer. We also have other proteins that are associated with the membrane, uh, but they are not embedded. Um, so they're called peripheral, meaning they're kind of like attachments is what the word peripheral kind of means. And uh, these are membrane proteins. They, they hold important functions uh, there, but they're just not embedded. So sometimes we use other terms for these um, uh, integral proteins, by the way. Uh, another term is transmembrane. Uh, and I see that word used a lot, particularly with this particular type of protein that has these, um, these alpha helixes that, uh, that span the membrane. This, by the way, um, each helix is about 20 amino acids, by the way. And then you've got these loop regions here. So these loop regions are connecting the uh, helices. So it looks like I'm looking at that one. I think there's one, two, three. It looks like there's seven helixes there. So there's, there's lots of uh, different types of membrane proteins. They come in different shapes and sizes and different ways to embed themselves. You can see I found this little diagram here showing some different, uh, different ways for membrane proteins to be attached. So you can see these ones over here on the left. Um, so these three here, they're all uh, fully embedded. Um, these ones here on the right, this one here is a lipoprotein. So we talked about lipoproteins. You can see most of the protein is found outside of the membrane but it's attached to a lipid and that lipid of course wants to be in a hydrophobic environment so it kind of anchors itself into the membrane and there's lots of different systems so don't be surprised you know in your travels that you see different types of membrane proteins there's uh, there's many many different types uh, here's a protein that uh, that i worked on a few years ago uh, and you can see this one is anchored by a single alpha helix most of the protein is separate from the membrane but it is anchored and attached by a single hydrophobic alpha helix so kind of an interesting little system there. So what are these proteins doing, by the way? Um, basically, they're doing everything that proteins do uh, and more because they're membrane proteins. So they have specialized membrane functions. So some of these are transporting things uh, inside and outside of the cell. Uh, many of these proteins are, in fact, enzymes. That's what many of the proteins in your cell are doing. Uh, some of them are uh, receptors. So we have all sorts of hormones and chemical signals that are going from cell to cell. And, um, and some of them are taking that signal from outside of the cell and they're, they're bringing it inside. This is called signal transduction. So if you take any, any courses where you're talking about neurotransmitters and things like that, they, they talk about transduction a lot of, a, you know, let's say transduction of an action potential or something like that. Uh, some of them are uh, helping us to recognize different cells, right? Uh, so this is part of being a complex organism is that our, our cell, our tissues need to know what's going on, right? Uh, you know, you want to make sure you're attached to the right kind of connective tissue and so on. Uh, some of them are kind of like attachment. Um, so if you think about uh, many of your organs, all your cells are attached together. And uh, so some of them are kind of a little bit like rivets and, uh, uh, or glue, just depending on the type of protein and all that. So many, many functions for membrane proteins. And we're going to see some of those uh, in this course, of course. So the last group are the carbohydrates. And uh, this is the kind of thing that most people uh, forget about when they're thinking about membranes. And that's okay because not every membrane has carbohydrates attached to it, uh, although many do. So one thing I want to point out here uh, from this diagram is that all of these carbohydrates are on the outside. And so most of them are in fact attached to things. So some of them are glycoproteins, some of them are glycolipids, and of course uh, when you attach a, uh, a carbohydrate to something, uh, this is called glycosylation. So there's that word glyco. Every time you see glyco, 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 uh, you know there's a carbohydrate involved. So what are these things doing? They're all on the outside, right? And uh, most of these are for some sort of cell-to-cell -cell recognition. So, um, th so this is why these are extremely common in uh, multicellular organisms, because uh, like I said, we have, uh, we have many tissues. So if you think about you know, way back in the day, before you remember it, you started off as one fertilized cell, and, uh, and then you divided, and you were two cells, and then you were four and eight. And somewhere around that 64 cell, um, when you're a 64 cell zygote, um, you start to specialize, right? You know, eventually form some heart tissue, you're going to eventually form some bone tissue and brain tissue and so on. And so this is part of that communication 
where your body needs to know, you know, am I dealing with blood cells or heart cells and all that? And so they're kind of like little tags. I like to think of them as baggage tags to say, this here is a skin cell. And then this one will have a different carbohydrate and, and that will say that this is a, a, a red blood cell. So you might know about the blood groups, right? So some people are A, some people are B, some people are AB, some people are O. Uh, this just reflects that uh, those people have actually different carbohydrates found on their, um, on their red blood cells. And uh, so when you get a blood transfusion, you gotta make sure you have a compatible, uh, basically carbohydrate, right? Or else your immune system uh, will not be happy and, and it could, uh, could be very, very serious. So that's what carbohydrates are for. And like I said, they're not always there. They're a small part of the, uh, the membrane in terms of the actual mass. Okay, so I want to show you a kind of a sample question. Uh, this is um, uh, kind of, uh, I wouldn't say it's an easy and I wouldn't say it's a hard multiple choice question, but it's uh, kind of similar to what you could see on a, a, a midterm. And uh, I just want to show you that in order to answer these questions, it's really, really, really important for you to know your vocabulary. So you can see it says here, which of the following is not true about the membrane proteins? So look at all these words here. We've got uh, integral, peripheral. Uh, we've got something about hydrophilic. Um, so you need to know what all these words mean in order to answer the questions. And this is why I really encourage you after we finish every unit that you do go through that vocabulary list and, and physically write down definitions of all the words I have at the end and anything else that you don't understand. Um, just like any class, right? It's important that you understand the words and use the vocabulary. And, and if you use them you know, with your friends and in conversations, that's how you're gonna learn these words really well. So I always, I always joke with my students, you know, it just, it just warms my heart when I hear students in the, in, the, in the hallways of the college and I hear them talking about E. coli or, or they say something like hydrophobic and it's just, it's just wonderful to hear students use those kind of words. So let's take a look at these one by one, okay? Uh, a, integral proteins are found embedded within the phospholipid layer. So yes, integral, remember these are the integrated ones? So that is true. Um, B, peripheral proteins are loosely associated with the membrane. Yes, that's true. That's actually kind of the definition of a peripheral protein. Uh, C, membrane proteins can be channels that allow molecules to pass the phospholipid layer. That's right. That was one of the functions we talked about. Uh, integral proteins must be comprised of mostly hydrophilic amino acids. Okay, so this is where we have the problem, right? So remember, integral proteins are fully embedded, and so most of the amino acids are not going to be hydrophilic, they're going to be hydrophobic. So this one here is wrong, and that is the one that's not true. So it probably means E is true. Let's just check. Peripheral proteins can be enzymes. Of course they can. That's one of the functions that we talked about. So D is the correct answer, the one that is false or not true. Okay, I think I've got a little arrow there for you. So make sure when you read your questions, you go through one by one and read each of them carefully. Uh, sometimes there's a best answer, but usually, um, usually there's one answer that is far better than all the other, others, but uh, do make sure you read uh, the questions carefully. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about membrane models. Uh, the main model of a membrane is something called the fluid mosaic model. This has been around since the 1970s. And the whole idea behind the fluid mosaic model is, is these two words. Fluid, this is referring to the phospholipids. And mosaic, this is referring to the, uh, the proteins. So we, we, I showed you this exact diagram already. And uh, you, can, you can kind of think of it as uh, we've got an ocean or a sea of phospholipids, and so they're, they're kind of fluid. And in fact, the phospholipids, um, they're kind of like a, you know, in terms of fluidity, think of like a, a thick salad dressing, right? Uh, they can move around uh, relatively uh, uh, easily. And the mosaic part um, is this smattering of proteins that are found embedded in the, uh, uh, kind of like icebergs in, in an ocean or a sea, right? They can float around. So uh, how do we know this is true? Well, we've been doing studies on membranes for a long time. Um, there's one kind of study I wanted to show you, which is kind of a cool type of study that uh, was looking at uh, these embedded proteins. And um, it's called, uh, it's a type of, um, of electron microscopy. Uh, it uses scanning electron microscopy. It's called a freeze fracture technique. 
So what they do with a freeze fracture technique is um, they freeze the cells and, um, and then they, they just they peel them apart, right? So you can imagine when you peel something like a fruit, you peel a banana, um, the, uh, the peel comes off at, at the area of least resistance, which is between the skin and the fruit, which is very handy if you get a banana. Uh, and in the case of a cell, uh, the area of the least amount of resistance is actually right in the middle of that phospholipid bilayer. So you can peel it apart, and you can peel the membrane apart like that, and then you can use scanning electron microscopy, and you can see all these embedded proteins. So it's a pretty cool technique. Uh, what about the fluid part? So there's a couple of really famous experiments that look at the fluid part. Uh, this is uh, the image from the textbook. Um, it's kind of annoying because the original experiment was actually red and green, but I think they changed it to red and uh, blue or purple because um, well, some people have a hard time with red, green color blindness. So I'm not sure whether this helps or not. Um, but the idea behind this experiment was that they used some fluorescent stains and they stained the proteins on uh, two different cell types. I don't know why they used mouse and human, why they couldn't just use two human cells or, or two mouse cells or whatever. It doesn't really matter. But what matters is you have two cells with two different fluorescent stains on them. Then you can stick them in a, in a, a test tube or a dish and uh, you use a, a certain type of detergent that will actually allow those membranes to kind of uh, fold into each other. And they do. And uh, give about an hour, and you can actually, under the microscope, watch those proteins slowly move and migrate and diffuse. So this shows the fluidity of the membrane. Like I said, it's slow, like thick salad dressing. I have a little uh, animation I can show you. I know this is a really cheap animation, but you get the idea here. And, you know, people put these things on the internet, so I may as well make use of them. So this is showing the fluidity of this. So wanna, I do want to talk about the fluidity of these um, of these phospholipids for a couple of minutes. Um, so they can they can move um, really in three ways. I know this diagram is showing two ways, but uh, the lateral movement involves um, them uh, moving in terms of uh, swapping places. Uh, they can also rotate as well. That's what I mean by second movement. But the lateral movement is very fast and can happen very easily. Uh, the flip flopping. So between one side of the membrane and the other, that's pretty rare. Because if you think about it, I would have to take this polar uh, part of the molecule and force it to go through a hydrophobic part to do that. So that is not something that's done very easily in terms of the uh, thermodynamics of the situation. So I have a little video here for you. And you can see um, this membrane moving around. It's got some proteins here. And you can see they kind of move around. Like I said, if you, if you think of them as little icebergs moving around in an ocean. And I'll press play for you. And there they go. One problem with textbooks is all the images are still, right? So uh, sometimes it's nice to have videos to show you that cells are very dynamic. They, uh, they move around and they, uh, you know, their, their parts are, are constantly moving. So let's think about fluidity for a minute here. Um, what affects the fluidity of the membrane? Um, mostly the fatty acids. Uh, you can have long ones, you can have short ones, you can have saturated ones and unsaturated ones. So depending on the type of intermolecular interactions that are going on here. So you can see my first uh, note here is the length of the fatty acids. So longer fatty acids are more like butter than oil. Shorter ones are more like oil than butter, right? So the longer ones, they stack better. There's more uh, intermolecular interactions. So longer ones mean uh, less fluid membranes. Uh, saturated uh, is also more like butter. So remember the unsaturated here, this is my unsaturated one. And uh, remember they, they don't pack so nice, so they slip around a little bit more. So some organisms can actually uh, change their, their fatty acid composition uh, to compensate for um, you know, making their, their membranes more or less fluid, uh, kind of like with things such as uh, temperature changes. So kind of cool. Um, there's, a, there's a picture showing uh, the saturation of the fatty acids. You can see the uh, the, the unsaturated ones have the, the kinks and they're a little bit more fluid, right? The third thing is cholesterol. So cholesterol uh, looks like this. So remember what type of molecule cholesterol is? Cholesterol is a steroid. So a steroid is a type of lipid. So a steroid has these four rings on there. And notice that uh, it has one oxygen on there. So this thing is almost entirely hydrophobic except for that one little oxygen. So you can see on my membrane, the little oxygen uh, kind of pokes out and, and uh, gets in the polar zone, right? 
So explaining what cholesterol does is, it, it's uh, unfortunately it takes a lot of time. So I'm just gonna just kind of talk about it very briefly. But what it does is it regulates the fluidity in such a way that uh, it, it allows the membranes to, to not be too fluid and not be too rigid, okay? So normally membranes are, uh, you know, the right amount of fluidity is a very kind of narrow window. And what they do is sort of stretch that out. So they kind of plug in holes when it's too fluid and uh, kind of, uh, um, and so they're really part of that regulation of the fluidity. And it's very easy for, um, very easy for, uh, these this is animal cells that have cholesterol, by the way. It's very easy for animal cells to add or, or take away uh, cholesterol to kind of regulate the fluid. So kind of the takeaway message uh, about cholesterol is that it regulates the fluid. It makes them uh, so they're um, just the right amount of fluid. They're not too solid and not too liquid, but just right. Okay, so at this point, um, another kind of midterm type of tip I wanted to talk to you about. So this is another um, question. Uh, I've had something similar like this on a midterm. Uh, usually the question's are a little bit longer. Uh, as I mentioned, I have some of these longer answer questions on midterms. Um, so this kind of question would probably, this would be part of the question, right? Uh, describe the fluid mosaic model. And uh, these written questions uh, are, are, you know, you gotta look at the number of marks they're worth. Um, they're worth five marks. So this kind of question, I remember having one about two years ago and I, I think I was asking, you know, something about with the aid of a diagram, uh, describe the fluid mosaic model and I asked them to discuss something else. I can't remember what the question was now. Uh, but uh, I, I won't be asking you to draw any diagrams in this midterm. It's a little harder with the online system. Um, but I, I could ask you something around the fluid mosaic model. So remember what we talked about. Uh, you need to use uh, the words of the course and the fluid mosaic model, right? We've got fluid, okay, and we've got mosaic. So that means you better talk about phospholipids and you better talk about proteins, okay? The other words that are very important is to talk about what's going on there. So we remember we have hydrophobic components and we have hydrophilic components, okay? So um, if I were to get you to draw a diagram, I'll show you a diagram in a moment. I have a next slide that I drew. Um, other things, uh, these other things aren't important to the fluid mosaic model, uh, but it doesn't hurt to add them, right? Uh, you know, when you're, when you're answering a question, right, uh, you know, adding an extra detail, you know, adds that kind of completeness that, uh, you know, is going to make me more generous and it's going to show me, you know, because your, your job as the student is, of course, to convince me, right? You've got to convince me that you get it. And so if you add these other things, it's not going to hurt, but it's not necessarily essential to, um, uh, to answering the actual question, right? So I'll, I'll show you um, uh, a diagram that I drew. So, um, the fluid mosaic model. The first part is the fluid part. So I'm going to be talking about phospholipids and how they have a, a polar part to them and a non-polar part to them. So you can see at the top here, I made this little diagram and then I drew a bunch of phospholipids. So I'm not necessarily asking for you to be amazingly artistic, but uh, in this case, uh, if the question was asking for a diagram, it's important to talk about this, that you have a hydrophobic zone and then you've got these hydrophilic zones facing the water. So the mosaic part, of course, is uh, dealing with the proteins, which I thought I had them on there, but it looks like I've got some cholesterol. There's some proteins. And uh, so remember, using the terminology uh, is, of course, integral membrane proteins. And, uh, and then, you know, a little bit more about uh, what's going on with these proteins. The fact that most of the amino acids would be hydrophobic is, is going to be kind of a part of the answer. So I did throw some cholesterol in there. Like I said, I was going to throw a couple more things on there just to... Uh, just to be complete, but they're not necessarily essential for the fluid mosaic model. So there's a peripheral membrane protein, and it looks like I've got a, a glycoprotein there, and it looks like I've got a glycolipid there as well. So anyway, there's some hints. Um, I'll be giving lots of hints over the next couple of weeks as we get close to the midterm, and we will have, uh, I'm hoping for, We'll definitely have one full review period, um, and if we have time, I'll have a little bit more than, than one complete review period uh, uh, leading up to the midterm. But just another hint that uh, it doesn't hurt to start looking at your notes now. We have covered a reasonable amount of material already, and uh, we're going to cover uh, uh, three more units, so um, uh, we're going to cover quite a bit more. So let's talk about membrane transport. This was the other thing I wanted to cover today and talk about membrane transport. 
So if you think about this, we've got our, we've got our membrane and it has that hydrophobic zone. So if you want to get things across a membrane, um, only certain things are actually going to get across that membrane to get through that hydrophobic zone. So what can get across relatively easy? Well, anything that's hydrophobic um, usually has no problem. Uh, and, uh, and, and usually small things are okay as well. Um, in fact, ox this is showing oxygen, by the way, and this is carbon dioxide. So those are actually hydrophobic molecules and, uh, and they will actually pass through, um, through membranes very, very easily. And then there's water. Water is very polar, um, but it's very tiny and very, very abundant. So it's kind of one of the few polar things that fit across a membrane very easily. So what does that mean? It kind of means everything else does not really pass through a membrane very easily. So anything that's large, anything that's polar, and uh, with polar, I'm also including um, charged things. Okay, so, you know, that's uh, sort of the same group. So let's talk about how we can get things in and out, because that's kind of the big job of our membrane is to get things in and out of the cell because of course the cell wants to bring in nutrients and get rid of its waste and so on. So the first type of transport, uh, you can call it diffusion or passive transport. And so this is where we have molecules and they're, uh, they're basically just moving around kind of randomly. And generally when they diffuse, they will go from an area of, uh, of a higher concentration to an area of a lower concentration. And so this doesn't require any energy other than just the ambient energy that happens to be in the environment, right? And so you can see in this little animation, we have uh, these cute little molecules and they're, they're kind of moving across the membrane. So this could be uh, oxygen, this could be carbon dioxide, um, this could be a variety of other hydrophobic molecules uh, that sometimes end up in solution. So you probably know that uh, one of the most important types of um, diffusion is osmosis. So osmosis is just the diffusion of water and it has a special name because water is super important in biology. And uh, so you can see, I'll just play this little animation and I didn't realize it was so short, but you can see that um, if you watch carefully, these green molecules, the big ones, uh, they kind of just do nothing. They don't go across the membrane. Whereas if you watch the water molecules, play that one more time, you can see they're moving freely across the, um, the membrane. So in the case of osmosis, it's the same idea. Water is going from a high concentration to a low concentration. So uh, if you take a look at this one here, uh, over here on the left-hand side, this is um, mostly water. There's actually, it looks like there's four, um, uh, four of those green large molecules. On the other side, we have uh, something dissolved. So it could be salt or sugar or something like that. And so the water is, uh, you know, maybe on the left it's 99% and on the right it's uh, 80%. So the water, of course, is going to go from the high concentration mostly to the low just by kind of random movements. So this thing on the right here, by the way, is another video. I'm going to play it for you. And you can see initially the water is just going to pass back and forth. And then halfway through the video, uh, they are going to add some salt. And of course, when you add salt to one side, it dilutes the water. And so the water is going to move from the high concentration, the left, to the right. So I'll play that for you. So there it goes. Like I said, just random movement is what we're talking about here. So there it goes, it's gonna add the salt. Now the water on the right is diluted, which means it's higher concentration on the left, and you end up with water flowing across that membrane to the right. So there are lots of uh, important implications around osmosis, and you probably know uh, a little bit about what is going on with uh, different types of cells. And uh, maybe you've seen these terms before. We've got uh, isotonic, hypotonic, and hypertonic. So tonic just means um, solute, and uh, the, the, the things in front uh, ha each have meaning. So iso means the same, right? So we're talking about the same amount of solutes inside and outside of, of that cell. So what you're looking at here, by the way, is a little animation of some red blood cells. So in the, I'm just looking at the middle for now, and we have uh, some water going in and some water going out at about the same rate, and so the cell is kind of nice and happy. Uh, take a look on the right. So on the right, we have hypertonic. So think about somebody who is hyperactive. They have too much energy. So in this case here, you're in a solution that has too much or too many solutes. So in this case here, the water, it follows the solutes. It 
flowing out of the cell and the cell is going to shrivel up and die. So that's not good for animal cells. They don't like to shrivel up and die. Uh, on the left, we have hypotonic. So um, hypo, if you think of like hypothermia, hypothermia means a person does not have enough heat. So in the case of hypotonic, there's not enough solutes. So in that case, we have a high concentration of water on the outside and the water flows in the cell. Uh, so I'll tell you my way to remember which is which. When I think of hypotonic, I think, you know, hypo, it kind of sounds a little bit like a, like a hippo, you know, hippopotamus. And uh, you probably know that hippopotamuses or hippopotami, I don't know what the plural is. Um, they're kind of roundish animals. <laughs> uh, and uh, so I think of the cell getting round and fat like a hippo. And that's how I kind of remember what's going on. So animal cells, we like to be here. We like to be isotonic. And that's really important for our cells. Or else we shrivel up and die, or we grow fat and burst. So here's, um, here's the diagram from the, uh, from the textbook. And you can see they're showing the same thing with those red blood cells. They're bursting in the hypotonic, and they're shriveling up in the hypertonic. Turns out, though, if you are a plant cell, you probably know that plants like water. Uh, if you get flowers from somebody, what do you do? You put them in water. So these things like water, well, it turns out they have cell walls and cell walls protect them from bursting. So if you take a look, isotonic is kind of okay, but uh, you might end up being a little bit flaccid. Um, but in lots of water, uh, water will flow into the cell and it actually goes in the central vacuole here and it pushes and the cell ends up being turgid, which means firm. And it doesn't burst because it has this cell wall. So this here is the cell wall here and uh, it holds it firm. And uh, in the cell, you know, if this was a carrot or a, or a cauliflower or some vegetable, it's nice and crunchy, and that's kind of what we want, and that's what the plants want. Uh, hypertonic is bad, bad. You don't want to be putting salt on your flowers. Um, they will shrivel up, and, uh, and uh, you can see in this case, we've got the membrane is, uh, is actually tearing away from the cell wall, and uh, the term for that is plasmalized. So I have... Uh, some uh, images coming up, actually some, some plants in a moment. So one thing I want to show you is this paramecium. Uh, this is not an animal cell, but this is uh, an animal-like cell, I guess you could call it. Uh, we're going to be talking about paramecium's in lab five, and uh, they have no cell wall, and they like to live in ponds. So part of the question is, why are these cells not bursting open and dying? Uh, well, it turns out they have this thing here. It's called a contractile vacuole. So take a look. I have a video going here, and I want you to watch this video carefully. And uh, right where that arrow is, if you watch, here it goes. Anytime now, you can see it, uh, this big circle kind of shrink. Waiting for it, waiting for it. There it goes. Hopefully you saw it. So basically, uh, it's pumping water out. It's called a contractile vacuole. So we're going to talk about these contractile vacuoles a little bit. Um, in the diagram here, you notice that that cell has two of them. Uh, you can check out this YouTube link. It's actually a different video than what I'm showing here. And uh, I actually have some really nice uh, footage of these contractile vacuoles. So here's some plants. You can see isotonic. Uh, this is Elodea. So I'm just looking at the left for now. Elodea is the plant that I had in uh, the lab yesterday. Um, I took that picture, by the way. I was really happy with the pictures. And uh, if you take a look, what you're seeing uh, up on the top here is a little cartoon showing you that right here in the middle is a giant central vacuole. So this is a central vacuole. And uh, so the water is kind of, it's pushing, uh, again, those chloroplasts to the edge and, and the cells are, are nice and turgid. Uh, on the right, you can see what happens when the water, if you put salt on these things, the water gets sucked out. The chloroplasts, they kind of clump in the middle and you can see these big clumps right here. Uh, in the cells. So this one on the left, by the way, is actually a video. I'm going to play this for you. So here goes, and you can watch what happens when you add the salt. You can see the water is draining out slowly, and the chloroplasts are starting to uh, start to clump up in the middle. So kind of interesting thing to do and to see under the microscope, and uh, I'm glad I have this video here to show you. All right, so plants, they like to be hypotonic. Plant, uh, animals like to be isotonic. Nobody likes to be hypertonic. So what if you have a molecule 
that you would like to diffuse across, but it's just too big or too polar to get across that membrane. Well, not a problem. Uh, we have a system that's called facilitated transport. So you probably know what the word facilitate means. It means you're helping out. So in this case, what we have is um, some sort of protein, and that protein is, is a helper and it's, it's allowing things to get across. And there's different systems for facilitated diffusion. Um, there's, a, there's a couple shown here. You can see one uh, simple type is something called a channel protein. So probably that's uh, pretty easy to understand. It's like a hole, and uh, that hole or pore is gonna be the right shape and the right size to allow that molecule to go through. So here's, here's an example of a sucrose porin. That's a type of channel protein, and it transports sucrose probably no surprise there. You can see it's actually kind of, uh, it, it has three, three uh, areas for sucrose to go through. And uh, it's going to be polar, like sucrose is polar, and so it's going to have complementary uh, uh, chemical um, uh, kind of uh, properties for the inside, and it's going to be the right size for sucrose to go through. Uh, you can see on the bottom we have something called a carrier protein. And uh, so that carrier protein is um, uh, kind of a little bit more like a hinged gate. And you can see um, right here, we've got our, our molecule and uh, it's, it's binding in and then it hinges and allows it to go out. I have a little animation for that one too. Uh, there's a, a lactose um, a permease that's found in E. coli. So I'll show you the little animation here. You can see the molecule is going in, it hinges and goes out. So just a little bit of a different system. There's a whole bunch of uh, different types of these systems. These are kind of the most common too. Okay, so up at this point, we've been talking about things that are transported uh, and uh, they are going, um, it, it's all no energy investment here, going from a high concentration to a low. So you probably know where this is going. I know people, uh, you talk about this and I think it's grade 11 um, biology, but uh, something called active transport. And so active, of course, means active, right? And it means we need energy. So here's where we're gonna bring things and we wanna move them against a concentration group. So in this case here, we're usually dealing with um, some sort of uh, protein as well. And uh, the protein requires energy and that energy is often ATP. There are other forms of energy for active transport, but ATP is kind of the big one. And so you can see there's some ATP. It's gonna pump these from the outside to the inside. So this is probably some food that that cell is, is wanting to have. Uh, there's just a little uh, animation on that, and, and you can see, again, it's got the cute little molecules, so I thought you might kind of like that. Uh, if you're looking for some interesting biology animations and cartoons, go check out the Amoeba Sisters. They've got a pretty good website. So let's talk just for a moment about ATP. We're going to come back to ATP later. So what is ATP? It's an acronym, and it stands for adenosine. So this thing here, that is adenosine. And the T is for tri and the P is for phosphate. So you can see I have three phosphates here. So ATP. So one thing I see when I see ATP, and uh, this is because I have a background in biochemistry, is I see oxygen, negative charge, oxygen, negative charge, more, 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 a whole bunch. So what does that mean? Well, you probably know chemistry, right? You, negative charges, they don't like to be beside each other. So that means in order to make that thing, it took them a certain amount of energy. So that means when you break this thing apart, it's gonna release energy. So there's lots of energy in those bonds there. So usually what happens uh, in a cell is when it needs some energy, it will take ATP, breaks it down into ADP, so the D is for dye because we have two phosphates, and, uh, and, and it releases energy. So there's some little cartoons. By the way, if you ever see this kind of thing, the P with the circle around it, it means the phosphate. It means somebody didn't want to draw those oxygens and bonds. It's just a much simpler way to do it. And you can see the P here has a little I beside it to say that it's inorganic, meaning there's no carbon attached to it. Um, but just uh, kind of some of the annotations you'll see. So one of the, uh, the, the best um, understood active transport systems is the sodium potassium pump. This is really active in your neurons, by the way. And uh, you can see this is actually a pretty complex uh, active transport system. It's transporting three sodiums. So if you take a look at how this works, you have three sodiums that uh, will attach to it. It's kind of a hinged gate thing. But this doesn't naturally uh, hinge like facilitated transport. Uh, this requires ATP. So you can see here we have some ATP that's breaking down and into ADP and that little phosphate. 
And that is enough to hinge this gate and release those sodiums outside the cell. But of course, there's, there's uh, potassium. And when the gate is hinged outwards, now it has pockets to, that will bind potassium. And so the potassium binds, and then this is the signal that basically hinges it back to the, uh, the cytoplasm, releases the potassiums towards the, uh, the cytoplasm. Okay, so I'm just looking at time here. We have a few more minutes. Um, I was hoping to talk about a little bit more, and I think we'll be able to cover some of it, and we'll see how much we, we get into it. But uh, I'll try not to go over time today. I know it is um, Friday afternoon, and uh, nice balmy minus 14 out. So, um, you know, I don't know, everyone has probably lots to do. So there's kind of the three things that we talked about, right? We had diffusion, we had facilitated and a diffu uh, diffusion, uh, and of course, active transport. So I want to talk about one more kind of transport that is, uh, I guess you could call it active transport, but um, really what I'm calling is bulk transport, meaning what if we want to transport a whole bunch of stuff all at once? Uh, we're talking about some different systems here. So these systems are called exocytosis and endocytosis. So let's just pick apart this word for a second, cyte. When you see cyte, that means cell. And when you see osis, Osis kind of means a process, right? Osmosis or whatever, right? So right now we have a process to something to do with the cell. And so when you have endo, that means bringing something in, and exo means pushing something out. So if you take a look, here's some exocytosis where you have uh, uh, something the cell is trying to get rid of, maybe some waste products, and it's found in a membranous kind of compartment. And that membranous compartment actually will fuse with the plasma membrane. And there it is. And then uh, once it fuses, the, uh, the contents can get, uh, can get expelled. Endocytosis is basically the exact opposite process. So you have uh, um, the membrane will make a, a little pocket and it will bring uh, whatever that is in. And then it, and that little pocket eventually uh, gets inside of the cell. So here's a little uh, diagram, or a little diagram, a little animation for you. And you can see there's some, uh, uh, some endocytosis. You can see in this case there's some food and that food is being digested by some, some enzymes. And um, in this case, uh, I'm not sure why, but it's actually expelling um, some waste products as well. So you can see uh, endocytosis and exocytosis all in one animation there. So I do want to talk a little bit about um, endocytosis and, and maybe I'll come back and review these next day a little bit more detail. Um, but there's different types of endocytosis. Uh, and so it's worth it to know these words because they're, they're actually used quite frequently. Uh, uh, and uh, so the first type here is phagocytosis. So we, we saw this here already, okay? Remember we were talking about bacteriophage? Um, so that word means something like eating. So phagocytosis means cellular eating. And uh, this is where uh, these, these uh, cells will make this pocket uh, or mouth or whatever you want to think of it and uh, basically they're trying to eat something or or in some cases destroy it. This could be an immune cell trying to destroy a virus or something like that. So if you take a look um, you can see there's this uh, this term I wanted to find for you. Pseudopodium. So pseudo means fake or false. Okay, and podium, if you think about a podiatrist, that's like a foot doctor, that means feet. So these are like fake feet. I think they're more like arms, but um, I didn't name it. And uh, so you can see what they're doing there, and you can see the second part, it fuses with a lysosome. So a lysosome is a digestive compartment, and we're gonna talk about them in, a bit more in, um, in topic six. So uh, there's uh, an electron micrograph showing that process, and uh, I've got a little video I'll show you of an amoeba that's trying to eat, uh, I think he's trying to eat a paramecium. So let me play that for you right now, and I think I'll probably finish after this video here today. Oh, eating two paramecium. Sorry. I don't know why that's noisy. I'm just going to turn the volume off. Anyway, you can see the amoeba. An amoeba is... Um, it's a unicellular organism and they, they move around by, by changing the shape of their, uh, their cytoplasm and that's how they eat. And you can see this one has, has taken in um, two paramecium and uh, well, it looks like the paramecium aren't very happy about the whole thing. 
and uh, and and they're gonna eventually get digested. And I know it's sad, if particularly if you really have a, you know an infection for for paramecium, but there are lots of paramecium in the pond, and, and the amoeba do have to eat. So that is phagocytosis. All right, I see we're out of time today. So um, I'll come back to phagocytosis next day and a couple other types of endocytosis. And um, we'll, uh, um, maybe I'll review a couple of things. I know I didn't have a Kahoot today. Uh, I um, was thinking about doing one, and, um, but I think what I'm gonna do is, is save that for, for next day because uh, um, I was realizing that uh, I wanted to I sort of had a place I wanted to get to today and I was hoping to cover just a tiny bit more. So next day be prepared to do a Kahoot and um, I hope you have a great weekend. I'll see you then.